Hello. Folks, if you can hear me, say all is well or audio is good. If you can't hear me, we have serious problems and we'll never be back again. Oi, 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 oi. The background is um, YouTube asked us to verify and all this crazy shit last minute. Oh, audio's good. We're good to go. All right. Boom. Boom. Okay. Crisis averted. We're good to go? We did it. All right. Folks, YouTube says now would be a good time to insert ads. Oh, like we talk about stuff that you buy or whatever. Yeah, 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 buy stuff right now. I don't care what ice cream truck drives by your house. I'd shoot out the tires first and then buy stuff. In any case, why don't I just shut up and answer your questions? Thanks, Dr. Mike. Great idea. Scott, the video guy, what do you say? Start with the super chat people? Yes, sir. Okie dokie. Do Okie dokie. Uh, all right. It says top chat. And I click on the top chat. Yes. All right. William Parchiak, I think, asks, for barbell rows, if protracting allows you to stretch all the way to bringing slash resting the bar on the floor, does it make a difference compared to an unsupported loaded stretch of the same distance? Protracting allows you to stretch all the way to bringing the rest of the bar on the floor. Ah, I see. You know, it depends on how much rest you have on the floor. If it's enough rest to completely unload the motion and there's no longer tension being transmitted through your back musculature, yes, it's not as good. But if there's just the same or almost the same amount of tension and just enough to touch the ground and feel that it's there but not unload the bar, then it's pretty close to identical. And the good news about that form of rowing is that by touching the ground every time and still feeling the load, you get the standardization of the distance. And in addition to that, you get the full stretch. So it's all winners front to back. So it's, that's my preferred method of doing the row. The second best method of rowing would be the full super deep stretch without touching because the deep stretch is important. And the third best method of rowing would be when you just kind of row and, um, you know, touch the ground and unload, which isn't terrible, but not the best. All right. Next up, Viper 16157856753098. Scott, does anyone actually know the numbers to that song? 8675309. I wasn't born in 1969, so I don't know that. In any case, he asks, hey doc, I'm going to get surgery soon and as a result will be bedridden. That is a morbid way to put that, but nonetheless accurate. How long to regain lost muscle when I'm healed? I have two years experience. Viper, I would love to help you out, but you omitted a great ultra important detail here. The detail is this. I want to know how long you will be bedridden for because how long you're bedridden for is roughly the amount of time it's going to take to regain your muscle until you reach about a month of being bedridden. And then you can actually regain your muscle a little bit faster than how long you're bedridden for. So if you're bedridden for like six weeks, it might only take you about a month to regain all the lost muscle. If you're bedridden for like eight weeks, you might be able to get rid of or get rid of, regain all the lost muscle in something like five or six and so on and so on and so on because your muscle loss tends to decline. There is another thing. If you're bedridden and you're doing some upper body exercises and moving around to the extent that you're able, and maybe even doing there are some exercises you can do in bed. Like if you've had an abdominal surgery, you can do some leg lifts and move around. You may be able to stave off muscle loss to a significant extent. So there is that. What I will say to you is this. Once you are back to training, make sure to ease back into training because the very minimum tiny, tiny little uh, stimulus is going to be superlative for you and crazy. It's going to make you psycho sore. Don't overdo it. Because if you overdo it, remember your joints and connective tissues are not going to be as strong as they were before and your muscles will grow back faster. So you can get into a situation where you're like three weeks into training, you're like eating barbells and shit like that. And it turns out that's not good for your health either. But on a serious note, ease in. Let the easy work happen. As long as you're getting pumps and getting sore, you're regrowing muscle like fucking wild. So if you're like, oh, I only did one set and I got crazy pump and then I got sore for two days. What's wrong? Nothing. It's the rightest thing in the world. It's like when you started training again. Ease in and only do as much as it takes to get good disruptions, which will be very little 
slowly, slowly deload, slowly deload, then at some point, you're just gonna get all your shit back. Here's another thing. Unless you're like 67 years old and get some kind of crazy disease after you get out of the bedridden stuff, or if the surgery severely impinges on your ability to perform, you are going to get all of your gains back within a very steady rate, and then you're gonna get new gains. So don't you get depressed or upset any amount of time, because this is gonna be a thing. If you're bedridden for some time, you're finally gonna stand up and they're gonna say, hey, you can't stay at the hospital anymore, sir. We've run out of jello to feed you. You're gonna look at your body in the mirror and go, holy fucking shit. I remember when I broke my arm once when I was 13, well, once when I was seven, and then again when I was 13. You know, every few years I like to break the old left wrist. The right wrist, I can never break, you feel me? I looked at my hand when they cut the cast off and I was like, this is like what an alien's hand looks like. Cause it was skinny as fuck. Like I could almost see my bone. And I was like, oh my God. And then like a few weeks later, it was like nothing ever happened, right? It's gonna freak you the fuck out when you get off of the hospital shit. You will build back better, bigger, stronger, faster, and dare I say meaner. Maybe not meaner. Don't you worry about a thing. Ease back in. And during the time that you are in recovery, just eat plenty of healthy foods, have a few snacks, don't gain weight, don't lose weight, stay roughly the same, or eat to hunger and high protein healthy foods. When you get back in to the mix of things, just make sure that you are eating very well and not stuffing yourself, but not starving yourself, and your body weight will naturally climb back up to basically close to where it used to be. Once everything's going normal and everything's back to normal, you resume normal training as if it never happened. Best of luck to you, sir. I hope it all goes really well. All right. Jared Feathers in the talk, in the chat, talking shit. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Who the fuck is Jared Feather? These motherfuckers come up with their own names now, huh? Oh, okay. Mike fucking Talon. You know what I'm saying? Jacob Beak. I can do all kinds of fake bird names, motherfucker. All right. Here we go. Another question. Super chat. From Connor McGregor was never my friend. Huh. I don't think he was anyone's friend, to be honest. Conor McGregor asks, I undertrained my arms for years, and now my back slash chest slash legs and shoulders are all noticeably bigger than my buys and tries in comparison. My back double bicep looks horrendous. Any advice on bringing this up? Yes. For the next several months, try this. For all of your chest and tricep work, if you do it together, and all of your back and bicep work, if you do it together, do, well, you work into this with lower set numbers, but two sets of triceps before you do the rest of the compound pushing for chest. Keep chest at maintenance, just like four or five sets per workout, that's it. For biceps, do two bicep curling movements first, then two back movements. Train like that and really emphasize how good your technique is on the tricep and bicep shit and how much stronger you're getting for reps over time. And your chest and back will not get smaller because they're already big and it's super easy to maintain muscle size when it's already big, especially with the work you do after back uh, or after your biceps and after your tricep stuff, your arms will get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Don't overdo it. Always heal with soreness and always make sure your performance improves. Deal it when you need to. That sort of structure is gonna put you on your way to much bigger arms. Hopefully that works out. Thank you so much for your payment, donation. I don't know. All right, another one. Scott, the video guy? Yes, sir. Okie doke. Michael Venables gave us an NOK 1,000 units of money. I don't know what denomination that is, but hopefully it's a one-to-one -one conversion with a dollar so I can finally buy that little tiny part of the rim on a Lamborghini that probably costs $1,000. In any case, oh, uh, Michael says, keep doing the good work, prayer emoji. I'm on track to compete due to everything I learned from RP. Unbelievable, I wish I could answer a question for you. Um, best of luck competing. Remember that if backstage you do this to the competitors and shank them a bunch, um, that's one less competitor you have to fuck with. Unless you shank them in a very specific way and it gets them leaner, especially in the abs, then you just fucked yourself. Seriously, best of luck. All right. Next up, Timothy Aldridge. <laughs> Oh, it just says, welcome to exclusive video content. What the fuck? Did Timothy say that? So. Scott, the video guy? Hey, fuck, fine. Oh, Timothy, if you said welcome to exclusive video content, you were correct. If that's just something the thing says because it wants me to welcome members or something, then what up, big homie? What's up, pimp limp? 
Mike, there's a right scroll arrow, and those are the people that donated first slash got Oh, why wouldn't it do it backwards? Yeah. So. All right, let me get to those people first. I just noticed All right, Sorry. no worries. First time, folks. Sorry, bear with us. Brian Harvey, who's been a member for five months, whoa, says, when is it best to include my rep matches versus my rep sets? You know what? My rep matches, because let's say you do 15 reps total, 15 reps with some my reps, another 15 reps with even more my reps as you get fatigued. Because we generally add one my rep match set at a time, my rep match is better than my reps when two things are the case. One, the muscle is a huge, huge recovery, super low fatiguing muscle that take, can just take a ton of volume and beating. And two, when a muscle increases its recovery ability and work capacity so fast, workout to workout to workout. You guys ever have a muscle where you're like, you do two sets for or whatever, skull crushers and triceps get sore as fuck. Then the next workout, you do two sets again and they still get sore as fuck. And you're like, well, am I never gonna go up to three? And like towards the end of your muscle, you go up to three sets. But maybe you have a situation where side delts, like two sets fucks them up in the first workout. And then after that, with side delts, you're, you know, like do three sets and it's like barely any pump and you're like, what the fuck? And you end up doing six sets and now you're starting to feel it. You're like, holy shit, what am I going to do? 20 sets the next workout? Ah, which you could do 20 approaches to failure. That's where my rep match is a really good idea. My rep match allows you to just slam the volume and slam the volume and slam the volume. So my reps are really good for a lot of kind of training, but my rep match is specifically the kind of my rep training that allows you to really get a muscle that needs a shitload of volume and needs a lot of volume scaling, a lot of volume addition, workout to workout to workout because it just adapts really quickly. So that is my answer for that. All right, click in the arrows and E, Edward Smith. Thank you for your payment donation. How do people say that? Scott, is it payment super or? Chat. Super, thank you for your super chat. That doesn't seem right. Dr. Mike, question on weight loss. January 1st, I was 345 kilos. I'm going to pretend it's kilos. Isn't that fun? 345, now 233. Wow, amazing. Uh, weight loss slowed. That's good. That's why you're not dead. I consumed 2,200 calories, 205 grams of protein, 250 grams of carbs, 50 grams of fat. Walk five plus miles daily. Lift three X weekly suggestions. Oh my God, I have the best suggestion in the world. For the next four to six months, I want you to go on a maintenance phase. That's when you take that 233, you start eating a little bit more normal food and let it go up to 240. Do not freak out. You can control this, I promise. It's not like 240 and the next day, 340. Get up to 240 and hang around 240. And you'll notice that as you reduce your cardio a bit less, you can still walk five miles plus, but maybe like walk three miles plus every day instead of five miles plus and eat a little bit more healthy food every other week, every week. And if your body weight starts to trend above 240, bring the food down a little bit or ease up on the cheat meals or something. Have a bit of cheat food, mostly healthy food. And over the four to six months of your maintenance phase, how much healthy food you're eating is probably gonna rise. That's gonna heal the living fuck out of your metabolism, so to speak. It's gonna reduce your diet fatigue. It's gonna mentally make you much more prepared to diet in the future. It's gonna clear the path. Right. right now you're like a, a, a plane that just flew like a crazy trans-Pacific flight and it's out of fuel, one of the landing gears is broken. We never tell the people in the back that shit. And it needs a fucking, it needs a little love, a little TLC. And that's gonna take four to six months. After that four to six month period, what is that like in next January? You can start another three to four month fat loss phase where you go from 240 down to maybe like 220. You do another two to three month maintenance phase, and then maybe go down to 210, and so on and so forth. But I'd say, you know, depending on how tall you are, you know, you could like stand to do a massing phase somewhere in there and get back up to 230 or 240 and be fucking jacked and all that stuff. If you need some insight on the process, I would consume as much content by Ethan Suplee as possible, because instead of starting at 345, he started at like 530 and did a lot of the wrong stuff, but then he's finally in that groove of fat loss phases and maintenance phase. Give that some thought, Edward, and thank you so much for uh, for your question, that's really good. All right, next up is Sylvan Sanesti. Well, Mike just doesn't sound like a cool name anymore, Sylvan. Syl Sylvain, amazing. Sylvain asks, how different heads of muscle are related? Hip extension and knee flexion are two different functions of the hamstring, but when my hamstrings are sore because of SLDL, I can't do well on curls. Yes, 
because the SLDL trains the whole fucking thing and the heads of the muscle that are responsible for hip extension when your knee is stable and also knee flexion are largely the same. The thing about muscle heads is people sometimes make a big deal out of the different kinds of muscle heads and long head, short head, this and that. But almost in every exercise, except for some funky ones, you get a ton of cross-contamination, which is why you should absolutely be doing some exercise to bias various heads or others when there's a specific different attachment or something like that. So for example, you should be doing some leg curling as well as some hip hinging. You should be potentially doing some overhead tricep work, although technically lat pull downs and pull ups hit that just fine for the long head. But just remember that oh, the overall muscle is trained like 80 to 90% no matter what situation you arrange the various heads in. So don't overthink this stuff too much and just Hit the shit, if it gets sore, move on and hit it again. Hit the muscle from just a few, one or two different angles every week and you're good to go. All right, next up, I hit the blue arrow. I'm a fucking idiot, you guys. This is... All right, um, all right. James Martin, sounds like a, like, a, like, like a famous person. All right, like, like Dean Martin, yeah, see? <laughs> Do you guys ever wish you lived in the 1920s? And you could, you could wear a flapper dress. Wait a minute, wrong gender. Eh. All right. James Martin asks, during the final week in a meso, attempting to achieve some functional overreach with sets in my compounds, what would be a good strategy to employ for consolidation of stressors without overdoing it? You know, James, there's lots of different ways to take this. My preferred approach is let the automatic increases in volume and a relative effort just take you where you're supposed to go. I wouldn't change much in that last week. You know, Jared and Charlie and I back in the day, especially Jared and I, we used to do all kinds of funky stuff at the, in the peak in the last little bit. And at some point we realized that just, so like for example, you do it, you're supposed to do five sets of leg press or let's say last week, week four, you did uh, five sets of leg press. But due to the auto-regulation you're programmed to do six sets of leg press in the peak week, but you get finicky. And I've always done this where I'm like, oh, I don't know, maybe you can do something fancy and do you know, like uh, three sets, but then drop sets or something. It turns out probably the best thing to do is just take the auto-regulation right to the face. It says do six sets. You did 400 pounds last time, now it's 405. And just six sets of 405. Match reps or beat reps, that's it. That will toast you alone in a, in a way that gives us two things. One, it's for sure an overload because we know there's no fancy shit to signal to noise ratio, this bullshit. We know what's fucking working. It's more than last time. And two, because you stick into the plan, there's no chance that you're going to do some weird shit that'll get you hurt or something like that or just not be effective. So I would just say, James, just stick to the fucking basics and go one up. I know it's fucking bullshit. I wish there was some fancy shit to do, but um, really you just keep going. Just on that straight and narrow. That's what my guidance counselor I said in high school. I was going to say, and now he's no longer with us, but I, I suppose that's a real person who could see this live and uh, complain. All right. Davy Boy 77. I assume there were 76 other Davy Boys, which were not to specification. I'm the 77th Davy Boy. Humanity, be warned. And in order for that warning to be fully comprehended, we're just going to answer your question, Davy Boy. Stay calm. If you wanted to lose weight, at a 500 to 1,000 deficit, it did nothing to avert muscle loss. What percentage of muscle to fat ratio could you expect to lose? Worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is if you're on a shitload of gear and you're ultra lean and you're eating a ton of food and you take that deficit to the face and you stop weight training, you come off all steroids. And then what ends up happening is the ratio is actually negative because you will gain fat while losing weight, while losing even more muscle than the fat that you gained, even more muscle than the weight that you lost. That would be the worst case scenario. Unlikely. We usually see in studies where they underfeed people, these are not so ethical anymore. They did a lot of them back in the day where um, on average humans seem to lose like roughly even amounts of fat and muscle as they diet down. For a while, it'll be more fat than muscle. Once they get to a point where they drop significantly below 10% fat, it starts to be like 50-50, um, which is why people don't increase in their body fat levels as they get skinnier and skinnier and they actually get leaner, but that costs you a lot of muscle at that point. So yeah, 
I would be worst worst case in most cases is 50 50. And that fucking blows. Can you imagine losing 20 pounds? Or like, I lost 10 pounds of muscle. We, you know, that would suck. All right. All right. SRK Manual, YouTube tells me to welcome you for some reason because you are a member. Yeah, if you guys want to become members, we do this kind of uh, similar chat with members only, like, gee, kind of like a few times a month with myself and Jared, myself and James. And if you really want to go the distance, just join Team Full ROM. Just Google it, Team Full ROM, and there's a website you can join. And for 30 bucks a month, you get workouts. What else do you get? Training, customized by myself and Jared. And Infinity Q&A all the fucking time in the Facebook group. You can ask, you can tag Charlie and Jared and I. We answer your questions. Like I answer at least five questions every single day just through type. I personally host a live every single week where I answer all questions and you can type them out. You don't have to make the live. You type them out a day before and I answer them with full everything. And then you can rewatch the live and get all the answers you need. So 30 bucks a month, you know, that's how much it costs to fuel up a tenth of a Lamborghini or something. All right. Elad Alice says, yo, can we not do an AB push-pull leg split? Can we do the exact same push-pull leg workout? Ooh, good question. So the principle in play here is variation. And it turns out that if you do the same thing three days in a row, and then the same thing in another three days, the first workout is significantly more effective than the second by a notable margin. If you continue to do that for weeks and weeks, it degrades in effectiveness. So we want some variation just to keep the effects roughly the same. So it's effective, 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 and the degradation occurs over weeks instead of over days. But the bigger problem is psychological stainless as well as injury proclivity. Let's say you're doing skull crushers on one of the push days, push day one. And afterwards you feel a little bullshit in your elbow. You think it's fine. You get sore, but there's still a little bullshit. You get into Thursday of that week, next push day. If you're doing push downs and dips, different exercises, they're not going to irritate very likely that same area in the same way, and you'll very likely heal so that next Monday when you do skull crushers again, it feels like a million bucks. But if you do skull crusher and then skull crusher and then skull crusher and then skull crusher, that little tiny ding becomes a really serious thing. We're fucking rhyming out here, daddy. Michael, who sent the thousand and okay, that's a decent amount of money. So. Is that a decent amount of money? Michael, if I have to come over to where, where's, where's that okay, where's that? Is that North Korean currency or some shit? Norwegian. Norwegian. Yo, yo, pause. Okay, pause. Hold up, Michael. Holy fucking shit. Okay. Um, let me finish answering this question and I'll get back to that shit. First of all, thank you so much for the obscene amount of money. But here's the deal. That consistently hitting the same movements over and over, especially if it's the same loading ranges, no bueno because it'll psychologically just gas you the fuck out. You're like, fuck this, skull crushers again. I'm out of here. And it can potentially injure you in a way that just keeps fucking you up. Bad deal. Okay, so instead of that situation, we want at least some loading variation. So if you insist on doing the same exercises in the same arrangement, I would at least do you know sets of five to 10 in the first part of the week, sets of 10 to 15 in the second part of the week. If you wanna do another layer of variation, recommended, I would take the same exercises, but flip the order around to some extent. Close grip bench first, skulls after on one day, skulls first with a heavier load, close grip bench second with a lighter load than usual on the second day. And then even better is using completely or mostly different exercises as well as uh, variations in exercise order and in loading. And then you got it made. I hope I answered that okay. All right. All right. Sir, M Mr. Norway. I assume you're the best person in Norway. My wife and I just started watching uh, Ragnarok which you guys don't pronounce like that. You pronounce it way cooler, but I'm learning tons of, it's a, it's a, you guys should check it out. It's on Netflix, so it's essentially free. And it's a bunch of just regular, I'm starting to describe it now and it seems fucking lame, but it's sweet. It's like high school students in a small town in Norway, Edda. And um, they are all, some of them are like reincarnated Norse gods. Like one kid is Thor, and then the giants are these rich people and they're polluting the factory. Like a big, of SJWE bullshit there. It's not that great. You know, like I don't watch shows with the crazy super conservative stuff either. I like to keep my shit pretty apolitical, but it's it, it's awesome. And the names, oh, the names and the accents, beautiful. I want to go to fucking Norway. There's this one girl, her name is uh, Isolde. I mean, this, we just have any, my name's Mike. My name fucking sucks. And Thor and fucking Vidar 
And, um, oh, there was a dog named Trim. Trim. Unbelievable. Anyway, thank you so much. Norway's the shit. If you ever come to America, sorry to disappoint. Don't come to Detroit. That's where I'm from. All right. Gni Pakave asks, I am three weeks into post-show rebound. My first show ever. Congratulations. I won my class at 53 years old. Holy shit. At 53, I'll almost certainly be dead. So you're way ahead of me. Advice on how to keep a good mindset as weight comes back. I was almost 250 pounds in July 2020. Show I was at 202. Today I'm at 213. Yo, so first of all, you are treating your rebound really well. <laughs> and when I did this sort of thing, my last show, you know what I'm saying? I was on stage at the um, night show at 217, 216, 217 pounds. I actually walked back from the night show and got on a scale and I looked at the scale and I was like, fuck. I was dry as shit, but like, holy fuck. And then three days later, in the evening, I was 255, and I was feeling awful. So your mindset seems to be already pretty sweet. And here I'll say this for the mindset. It's about that middle path. Don't eat 50 trillion Oreos, which you seem to not be doing, and blow up like crazy and feel sad about yourself and have swollen ankles and all the shit I did. <laughs> Minus the sad feeling. I love the swollen ankles. Also, don't be like, oh, I... 202, I'm my, my leanest. I'm going to gain over the course of five weeks. I'm going to gain up to 203. And then another six weeks, I'm going to gain up to 204. Like, don't do that. You can't stay that lean. It's no good for anything. Sex drive, mood, brain health, uh, training, muscle gain, none of that shit. So you have to put on some fat and also get some muscle gain out of that shit. So what I would say is gain one to two pounds a week until you hit like 225 to 230. And then see how you feel. I would train pretty hard this entire time and then take a deload, maybe take an active rest. And then look, if you were 250 at the beginning of the last mass phase, then consider floating back up to into the 240s and see how you are. Uh, so what I don't want you to do is to stay ultra lean, but what I also don't want you to do is to get super mega fat. So just slowly um, let your gains turn a little soft. This is a painful thing. And I think this gets to the mindset. It kind of, kind of fucking blows a little bit of dick because like, man, you're just not for many months, possibly a year or two, ever going to look like you did on that stage or in the first, in the couple days leading in or the couple days leading on. I mean, this is a certain look like where you're just, oh my fucking God, bro, I'm fucking shredded. That's the bad thing. So that part of your brain that tells you, I want to fucking look shredded again, just look at it and let it, let it float away. So if you focus on any thought long enough, it becomes not so powerful anymore. And just realize like, yeah, there was a time for this and that time is over for now. But as an intelligent human being, what should I value now coming out of the show? And I think the answer is you should value how good you feel, how good you sleep is, and how awesome and progressive your training is. And your training won't be awesome and progressive if you're trying to stay too lean. So see the food. You're eating food and you think, fuck, it's making me fatter. True. Just a little bit fatter. But fatter in such a way that it actually improves your hormone balance and makes you fucking better bigger, stronger, et cetera, muscle growth, all that stuff. So treat food as something that, yeah, makes you fatter, but that's okay. I wouldn't worry about that too much. Treat food as something that makes you bigger and fucking stronger. Switch that mindset, not into off-season strongman mode to where you're enormous. Oh, by the way, did you guys see my shirt? We can start making these on Team Full Rom. If you guys want to buy them some shit, they'll be cheap. And uh, if I see you in the street wearing this, we are for sure hugging. I will give you a hug. By the way, if you ever see me, literally, like see me in real life, when you go, Dr. Mike, and say, if my wife's around, careful, she has eye lasers. But if she's not around, I'll straight up give you a hug. You know what I'm saying? We'll take a pic for the gram, TikTok, fuck, swipe, swipe, fuck. Scott, we ever gonna get swipe, fuck off the ground? My man. <laughs> Working on it. I just shut up about that. <clears throat> Folks, we're back. We're still live, I mean. In any case, just focus on a little bit less of your body and how it looks and a bit more about how progress in the gym occurs. Keep that one to two pound increase for a while and then cool it to about a pound and to maintenance. And I think everything is gonna go super well. And uh, remember, once you get a certain level of leanness, it's easier to get back to that level of leanness next time. And I've also noticed through my bodybuilding career that as I get lean and get a show in and then come back up, I never come back up to quite as fat as I ever used to be. So if you run everything intelligently, you have nothing to worry about. You're not going to balloon into Jabba the Hutt. Um, 
and I think it's going to all go to super well. So thank you so much for your question. All right. The blue arrow seems to be not so working. All right. Oh, wait, hold on. Conor McGregor was never my friend with another question. Here's another Lamborghini payment. My man. Butlers, come get the money. Let's go to Lambo. I don't ever know where they are. Oh, that's right. They're playing crash test dummies with my Lamborghinis, goddammit. I have a lot of butlers. Uh, here's the question. I'm in exchange. What specific arm movements could I use and get very strong on and see great benefit? I have never felt cable tricep extensions activate any muscle at all. Tricep ideas, bro. Uh, you and I are like fucking soulmates. Cable pushdowns are like meh, and they always have been meh to me. Skull crushers. I'll give you a technique tip. Instead of throwing it back here and bending here first, break towards your hip at the elbows. Is that coming in on camera? Hopefully. Thumbless grip. Break towards your hip, elbows in, and then touch them wherever it falls. Chin. Nose, bridge, anywhere here is good to go. If you're super ultra flexible, and if you have sufficiently longer torso and shorter arms, you can actually touch your neck, have a spotter, or else they'll find you dead. Super big, deep stretch, and up, right again. Overhead, tricep extensions with an easy bar. Same idea, I used to be flexible enough and small enough to do these, I can't anymore. Elbows in. Break forward at the elbows, down, slow, pause, and back up. Touch the very back of your neck. It'll light you the fuck up. JM presses, even in a, I think in a Smith machine, these work even a little better. It's almost like it's like somewhere between a close grip bench and a skull crusher. Another thing you could try is do as many skull crushers as you can, rack the weight, have dumbbells close by, get them, and do dumbbell presses with a big stretch slowly lowering the weight, and it'll fuck your triceps to death. The cops will be looking at your triceps later thinking, what kind of wild animal would do this, would do this to somebody's tricep? It's okay, Bob, it's okay. This man did lots of skull crushers. Give that a shot. I will also say, after the skull crushers part of your workout, try to do some body weight dips or even some close grip pushups, and you will find that because your triceps are so fucked up and tired, now it's a super crazy tricep movement. So I noticed you didn't ask anything about biceps. Is it because my biceps are small? Yes, the answer is yes. Thank you so much for your question. Mr. Conor McGregor, I loved all your fights, by the way. All right, identity problem, which is a very interesting avatar, just gave us $20. Identity problem, ask yourself a question next time. Sir or madam, you have more than deserved it. All right. Guys are being ultra, ultra generous. I love you all. I was supposed to be Anna Nicole Smith. I turned out to be Dr. Mike. All right. Daniel Kanowski. Kanowski? Kanowski. I'll just pronounce it in Russian, I guess. Probably closer to the original Polish or some. Huge fan, Daniel says. Your advice has changed my entire training program and diet. Thanks, Doc. Here is money towards that Lambo. Okay. Daniel, first of all, thank you so much. Folks, another thing. I am not so good at very many things, but the thing I am terrible at is receiving money for no outlay of services to you. So if you wanna just send me money, thank you so much, I love you guys. But if you can also ask a question, I'll knock that shit the fuck out of the park and get you some fucking knowledge. Because without me knowing exercise stuff and helping you out, I promise you I'm a shell of a human being nobody wants to be around. So thank you for your generosity. And, and while we're at it, thanks for nothing, uh, Scott the Video Guy. What have you done lately? I made this all possible. You made this all possible? You just sit back there. As far as I know, you're doing nothing at all. <laughs> all right. Dalton, Daltonator87. Welcome to Priority Membership. Kind sir. Scott the Video Guy, you seem to be up and about. Is there anything I can help you with? Uh, we're going to have to do a battery change. We're going to have to do a battery change. Uh-oh. Folks, Keep if we have to do a battery change and we go away, we'll be back. So stay tuned unless the battery change doesn't work and then you feel like a little rumble and you see some blue light on the horizon. That mean we actually use an annihilator class battery and that if things go wrong, it can take a chunk of the earth out. No big deal. 
It's the Detroit metro area. Who gives a shit? All right. Austin asks, <laughs> that shirt shows you're a true entrepreneur. I hope that's spelled wrong. I don't know how to spell that word. God. All right, you guys. So I uh, back in the day, I took the GREs. Uh, graduate record exam in the United States is for grad school, and I, I did quite fine on it. But um, there's an essay portion where you have to type the essay with no autocorrect. So, like, I was trying to use some A-plus words and shit, you feel me? But I was typing them out, and I was like, holy fuck, I don't know how to spell this word in real life. And then back, back, back. Instead of, like, you know, inferenced, I'd be like, pointed to, and i just sound dumber. I failed the whole exam. All right. Austin, thank you so much. And Austin asks, what is the lowest and highest your cals have ever gone I did multiple weeks of dieting back when I used to use gear and didn't uh, account for thyroid um, stuff. I did uh, probably four weeks of dieting at 1,000 calories per day, weighing about 220, 215 pounds. I mostly spent the day in grad school doing work, walking insanely slowly back home, training, and being under the covers and watching old Batman reruns. It was terrible. The highest my cows have ever gone, and I'll give you two answers for this. Consistently, around 4750 in my last mass phase, which was fucking terrible. I never want to do it again, though I probably will. Um, yeah, 4750 doesn't sound like a lot, but I'm I guess I'm just like, I don't know, a bitch. Is that the is that the politically correct term? And it was tough. I'm not Jared Feather, I can't eat forever. But I will say that in I did a post-show diet recovery and I did it all wrong my last show, so I did well for a few days. But then um, I met up with Charlie after he won his show and, or sorry, oh, competed at nationals after winning a show the year before or a couple months before. And after nationals, Charlie and I are fucking best friends. We're in the same fucking place. And we're like, there's all these treats here. Do you want to eat them? He's like, fuck yeah. So a couple edibles down the hatch. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, I think I ate um, eight to 9,000 calories per day for three days straight. And then I felt very bad. And then I didn't eat much uh, after for a while. Yeah. Tough times. Should I just keep going? Um, yep, I'll tell you. All right. All right. Clown Shoe. Great name. Any concerns for lifters with bad hip slash ankle mobility squatting with a plate under heels to achieve depth? I ask this as a six foot seven tall bro. Bro, six seven. You could be like my father. You probably are. Hi, dad. No relation. Um, with no plans to compete, lunges slash split squats and okay substitute. Lunges and split squats are totally fine. Another thing you can do is lots of leg presses and hack squats where your ankle mobility doesn't need to be as high. Another thing you do is only descend to the depth in which your ankle mobility starts to push your uh, heels up and then don't go any further. Another one is get some um, squatting shoes. I don't remember offhand what the company is, but Omar Isouf has a, or is representative of a, invested in a shoe company which makes weightlifting shoes and one of their options is a really tall heel. Um, I would get some of that shit. As far as squatting with a plate under heels, try to get the plates that are like the smooth ones. Make sure you're really settled in and never go ultra heavy. I would say don't ever go lower than your 10RM if you have to stand on a plate because if something goes wrong, fucking shit, you're, you're gonna be, they're gonna be putting you back together like fucking Jenga blocks back at the hospital. Um, if it sets of, you know, 10 plus 15 reps, really good control and stuff in the squat, like super upright, then, then you'll be, uh, then you'll be okay. Be careful. Also, when you put your feet on there, do half toe, half heel plate, heel on the plate, toe, and really, really settle before you do anything and make sure the things don't move. Best of luck. All right. Next up, next question is from Daniel Green. Daniel says, hey, Dr. Mike, do you have any tips for scapular winging beyond the standard wall slides, push up plus grind out serratus anterior? Can never seem to get the shoulder blades under control. Daniel, unfortunately, I know almost nothing about this subject. What I will say is that if you get stronger and more muscular and more aware proprioceptively of your body over time, a lot of those issues tend to dissipate. And if you're doing exercises and you're aware of when the winging is starting to happen and you fix it and continue to do reps, over time it tends to happen less. As to the exercises you were talking about, uh, I'm gonna give you the really skeptical take of, I don't think anyone knows if they work very well. Um, they may not work at all. They may work to a considerable extent. What I would say is 
do a series of exercises that you believe is the best, continue to train with good technique. Once you get some traction and the problem is improving, keep doing what you're doing. Don't expect this to resolve in like something clicks and a week later you don't have it. It might take some time. So best of luck to you and I hope that works out. All right. Raid Kabir, welcome to Priority Membership, YouTube tells me to tell you. And you're so welcome. Okay. Let's see who's up next. This super chat thing is hard to operate. Ingrid Cold, a super villain's name, I'm sure. Hi, Dr. Mike, big fan. I have an irrational hatred of barbell bench press. Maybe it's rational. It also irritates my elbow. I told you it was rational. Uh oh, we're getting blinking, Scott the video guy. Finish the question. Are dumbbell cable press and fly enough for chest? Yes. Any alternatives you can suggest? Deficit weighted push ups, machine presses of all kinds, dumbbells at different angles, and try to uh, play with different grips and different inclines on the barbell press. But conventional barbell bench press is not required for any pec growth at all. You can get as big a pecs as you want with none of that shit. Folks, we're gonna tune the fuck out for like two seconds. We're gonna switch batteries and either YouTube's gonna fuck us off forever, we'll let you know, or we'll be back in like a minute or two and I'll answer as many of your questions as I can. We're on here for a bunch. Yeah, hit it. I'm ready. Good to go. Whatever. Oh, shit, I'm on TV. Ah, sparkling ice. Just like grandma never made in the Soviet Union. Ingrid, we're back. So basically, rational or not, and if it irritates your elbow, it's quite rational. You don't have to do bench pressing. It is a fucking insane illusion. Scott, how come there's not a light on the camera? Does that tell us anything? Yeah. This is just a backup. So the light is like telling me nothing ever? <laughs> so it could be live all these times and there's no light and I could be like, you know this is where I masturbate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make sure the camera's never facing you. It is always facing me. <laughs> Who the hell masturbates off camera? It's a waste of, uh, what's that website? Uh, OnlyFans? Yeah. Should I start an OnlyFans? Ugh. That's some shit you'll never unsee. Good God. All right. Anyway, Ingrid, yeah, you 100% just, Indrid, sorry, I've been calling you the wrong name. Good fucking God, I'm an idiot. Indrid, um, you don't need bench press. You just need high stimulus to fatigue ratio exercises, various dumbbell or barbell incline or flat pressing, even some wider grip, leaning your body forward dips, all kinds of machine presses, and you're totally good to go. No problem at all. Okay, Blackbeard Zorro, that's a hell of a name, asks, can the bulk slash cut style of dieting work for calisthenics athletes? Yes. However, you have to make sure that you have a clear understanding of your best power to weight ratio body weight. And the way you get that is just through experimentation. Here's what I mean. Bulk up to like 10 pounds bigger than you usually are. Your calisthenics result is gonna suck. Don't worry, it's temporary. Diet the fat off to get to like five pounds bigger than normal. And then spend about three months doing calisthenics at that body weight. One of generally two things will happen. Thing one is your performance is on average not as good because you're too fucking big. Okay, now you know that. Thing two is your performance could be better. It's possible the performance could be relatively equal, but or for simplicity purposes, we're going to throw that away. If it's equal, shit, you, got all, you, you can pick from whatever you want. But very likely it's either going to be worse or better. If it's better, fuck yes. If it's worse, go back down to your old body weight and see if it improves. And if and probably when it does, you'll be like, okay, my optimal body weight is definitely not as high as I thought it was. It could be at what I was at, or it could be lower. After a while of no dieting, take time to lose five or 10 pounds and keep training for calisthenics. 
if your performance declines, ooh, it turns out your optimal body weight was pretty close to where you were. And stay at that new body weight for two or three months to let your body reacclimate. If your performance increases, well, shit, but you got yourself a new low body weight that you should be staying. Remember, calisthenics athletes, for the most part, are not very large people. If, on the other hand, that weight gain experiment works and you're stronger and your calisthenics result is better, then stay there for a bit. Do a little fat loss phase to get even leaner. You'll for sure, your result will be even better. Maybe drop five pounds. And then after a few months, try to go up again. 10 pounds again to maybe let's say you started at 140. We realized like 145 to 150 was even better. Try to get to 150, 155 and see after three months of staying there if it gets better. If not, you go back to that middle ground and boom, then you found it. For the next little while, next year or two, that should be the body weight you stay at. If you found that if there's another performance increase, shit, keep going, right? Bulking cutting for the rest of us because like we don't care about performance necessarily. It doesn't matter. It's all bulk cuts and the average weight goes up. For you, when the weight goes up, you have to test it as it's stable to see if your performance is better. If it is, sweet. If not, no big deal. Now, here's the thing. As at a certain, let's say you do eventually find your body weight at which it's, it's optimal for you to perform, you can still put on muscle and reduce fat and get even better. And there, I would just bulk like, take two months to bulk like literally five pounds your performance might falter a little bit and then take another two months to cut another five pounds. Same weight at the end, but you might have a pound or two more muscle and a pound or two less fat. Repeat that a few times over a few years and eventually you're shredded as fuck. Bitches knocking on your fucking door with heavy dildos and you're like, Jesus Christ, are those for me? I should have never gotten good at calisthenics. Um, I think that's exactly how it's gonna go. Mike, we're getting a bunch of messages that we missed a bunch of do this arrow. Which way did the fucking arrow point, bruh? I know, it's crazy. Okay, injured we got. Oh, there's, oh, the, oh, wait, no. This UI sucks. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Ah, all right. Well, Michael Venables said, keep doing the good work. I'm on my track to, comp okay, so we got that one already. Why don't these go away? Damn it, YouTube. That one's done, right? But it, Sometimes I just get new ones refreshed randomly. Weird. All right. W folks, we are trying to get everybody. So if we take your money but don't answer your question, are we even allowed to do that? Fuck. We're not trying to do that. We're trying to get to everybody for sure. Mark Fletcher asks, happen to know about gastroesophageal reflux disease surgery? Holy fuck. I don't even know those words. Don't lift anymore because uh, reflux-induced cough won't go away. I don't know anything about gastroesophageal reflux disease surgery. What I do know is that there are many treatments for gastroesophageal reflux before you get to surgery, and I hope you've explored those with your physician. If that surgery is the last resort, it's probably pretty intense, but I imagine that after recovery from that surgery, you can probably go back to doing most normal activities. So I would say the general recommendation with surgery is really make sure you've exhausted almost every other option and that this terrible thing that requires surgery in your life is sufficiently bad for you to take all the risks of surgery. Wish I could help more with that. All right, Tim C says, RP diet recommends eating before dinner, but some recommend going to bed on an empty stomach to promote GH release. Can you talk about going to bed on an empty stomach versus something like casein protein? So it's not clear to me that GH release is really modified highly by how much food is in your GI tract. If anything, it may delay the pulse of the GH release to later. In addition, if you have growth hormone released while you have free form amino acids from casein, you're more likely to anabolize to construct muscle tissue. If you don't have any free amino acids from a meal you didn't eat, the GH release will mostly go to burning fat. It's kind of the question of do you want the GH to mostly work as a muscle increase modulator or as a fat loss modulator? And as long as your pre-bedtime meal generally isn't super high carb and high fat, and it's mostly just high protein, and especially if you eat it maybe an hour before bed, so a lot of the stomach-based digesting has uh, been done by the time you go to sleep, you should be totally in the clear. If you'd like to experiment with uh, finishing your last meal two or three hours before you go to bed, uh, and seeing if you get better results, that's totally cool. I don't think there's anything here I will worry about to a very large extent. All right. Tamor Day, welcome to Priority Membership. I feel like one of those like female post-apocalyptic, post like dy dystopian androids. 
Well, well, welcome to your new, new, new life, 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 life. Scott, is that just me or is that the camera? Uh, we apparently skipped a bunch of tracks and they went off the screen and they're not available anymore, so I'm going to have people react. So tell people we're good for them. Good. What the fuck? <laughs> I, uh, how did this? I think if you skip one and click the next one by accident, the old ones disappear. So you probably didn't even see them. Holy shit. Uh, should I hit pop out chat here? Pop out chat. I'm going to hit it. I'm going to hit pop out chat, okay? Oh, all right. Pop out chat. Um, okay. Viper, I can't, I see a new one. I'm just going to answer it. Viper161579 says, did you see Derek's new vid about you? Derek who? More plates, more dates? More plates, more dates? No. Um. It's probably about the oral steroids thing. I'll address that some other time. Um, also, in that oral steroids video, I think I probably made a few statements that could have been made better. I'll actually talk about one of them now. I, don't, I haven't seen his video, but I probably said something to the effect of a short course of orals will not significantly alter your test production, and that's something I knew was wrong before I even said it. The reality is a short course of orals or a short course of pretty much any sort of method of delivery will almost certainly depress and potentially completely extinguish your testosterone production. But the reality is that in almost every case, it is going to come back up relatively quickly and with relatively no ill effects. And especially if it's a short course of orals that clear the bloodstream quite quickly or clear the systemic uh, imposition quickly, then you're gonna have this time when you're on the orals and things are gonna go well, and then you're gonna have time when you're off the orals and maybe a weird week, maybe not even. I've watched a lot of people do this and I haven't actually met anyone who had any sort of ill effects. And then your test levels come back up and everything's great. So that's probably what I should have said. Um, there's probably a couple other things in that video I could have done better. I suppose that's true for like, uh, um, most things, oh, yeah, in any case, oh, and uh, Viper had another question. Oh no, he said, by the way, you should raise the price for questions because there's way too many coming in at once. How the fuck do you raise the price for questions? Is that even something we can control? I suppose Viper thinks it's the case and he seems like he knows what he's talking about. Scott, the video guy, you're fired. All right. I'm happy the people we missed, we've messaged us so we can go back and get Excellent, all right, all right. Nathaniel R says, best plan of attack for someone that is 30% plus body fat, I assume, or is it, yeah, 30% uh, plus body fat, that wants to lose fat and has struggled with losing weight because of depression. Thanks in advance. Well, I saw two prong you here. First, I would talk to a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, probably psychologist first, and start to work on the core architecture around your depression so that regardless of what's happening with your body weight, you can get at that and make it better. In addition to that, um, what I would do is I would not worry about losing weight because that can be fucking depressing. What I could suggest in your case may be a good thing to do is to focus on eating better, feeding your body healthy shit most of the time and a few pieces of junk every now and again, having some good physical activity, regular activity that you enjoy in your life, Getting a decent step count, maybe eight or 10,000 steps a day, get you one of these Chinese Communist Party step trackers so we know where you are. And go from there. And I think after some time, you're probably just gonna get leaner doing that stuff. And maybe that'll brighten your mood a little bit. And then you might be able to say, hey, I'm, I'm actually in the position where I can do a dedicated fat loss phase and not get so uh, so upset. But uh, I would say that speaking to a, a, a licensed therapist and, and really getting at the depression thing is probably a good idea. Yeah, it's a serious thing. Way more serious than, than weight loss, I'll say that. Harrison Grant asks, can we partner in selling Turk for hashtag Lambo fund? You know, I actually am made entirely of Turkesterone. How many Turkesterone tags are when you see this Thanksgiving? A little different spin to Turkey. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We're starting to sell fake Turkesterone ASAP. Is there an even real Turkesterone being sold? All right. Next up is Parker Johnson. 
Any insight on how to prevent headaches during training? Tried to take a one-week deload and the headaches eventually came back. Never had this before in five plus years. There could be many things that are causing your headache and if this continues, I would go see a doctor. Like a real doctor, not me. A medical doctor, not a sports physiologist. But um, here are a few suggestions. I would maybe decrease the intensity of your valsalva maneuver and how much you hold your breath to those two, two separate and somewhat interrelated pieces of advice. So let me be specific. Valsalva maneuver is when you brace you like that bottom of heavy lifts. Do that less. That may require lightening the load, but as the weight come down, kind of just breathe out. Weight comes up, breathe in, breathe out. Kind of just try to breathe normally and lift. It's not going to be the best performance, but you could have several weeks like that where you'd have zero headaches. And you're like, fuck, thank God I got the headache thing solved. And then maybe slowly start valsalving a little bit harder, but never super maximal. Another thing is some people subconsciously hold their breath when they're training. So I'll start benching a little bit. I used to train my sister way back in undergrad. And she was a fucking baller, but she would hold her breath subconsciously during sets of 20 in the squat. And I was like, Sonia, why are your lips turning blue? And she's like, I don't know. And I watched her on a set and I was like, you're breathing? Yes. And she's like, I don't think I'm breathing. Breathe. Don't do a hard or any Valsalva maneuver. And also make sure that your blood glucose is stable. Some people get headaches if the blood glucose drops. So maybe have like a, a snack before you go that's pretty decent in carbs, like a, a gabagel or something. And then maybe have a Gatorade with you and uh, just sip it uh, through the workout and it might, might help. If those things don't help, then uh, I would uh, definitely seek out medical intervention. All right, shall I keep going? I'm trying to scroll here to make sure. So, I... I close super chat mic, and then anyone who can even questions, ask them at Renaissance Periodization will be orange. Okay, we'll do a few of those then. So the first one is Joseph McGreevy, if you see that. Yes. Dr. Mike, on upper body day, why would we go push exercise, push exercise, pull exercise, pull exercise, and alternate this next upper body day as opposed to push, pull, push, pull for hypertrophy. So I have a very deep technical explanation for this in the hypertrophy uh, book that we have, Scientific Principles of Hypertrophy Training. But a quick explanation is sometimes it's better to get a ton of metabolite sequestration and do a ton of local damage to that muscle. And the best way is to inundate it with set after set after set. If you go a uh, set of one thing, a set of another thing that can take the metabolites and wash them out between sets more so, it can keep the systemic fatigue as high as ever, but the local fatigue sort of drops off. And we want the ratio of local fatigue to systemic fatigue to be as high as possible. So we want a dedicated session where we really do a lot of pushing and easier on the pulling and another dedicated session where we do a lot of pulling and less pushing. Another thing is that sometimes you can have machines in the gym that are closer to each other. And if you're doing wildly different muscle groups, you might have to walk across and that's kind of fucking annoying. And uh, you kind of want to finish uh, one thing and go to the other. Another more minor reason is like a mind muscle connection. So you get a big ass pump with like flies for pecs. And when you go to the machine press, you're super fucking pumped. You're ultra connected to your pecs and you could just crush the shit. But if you did a set of pull-ups after you did the flies, yeah, like it takes a couple sets to get really connected to the lats and kind of your pecs are a little bit in the way. And once you, you're still feeling them and once that resolves, you're like, great, I'm in tune with my lats now. And it's time to like go back to chest again. That kind of blows. It's totally, the, uh, the benefit is that your performance can be a little higher. So if you're a performance athlete, like a power lifter or a strongman or a thrower, the alternating method may actually be superior. But for hypertrophy, I have an inkling that this is the better way to go. All right. Buck Law, Lau, sweet. Um, Buck Lau says, thank you doc for everything. Lost 35 pounds. Wife thinks I look great. And that's so important. I feel great. Life is good. Question, advice on how to choose a career for longevity. Holy shit. Um, so it depends on what you mean by longevity. Do you mean longevity of the career still making you money after some time or a career that doesn't kill you? I would say career for longevity, probably the two things you want to concern yourself with, if it's for actual, the career itself, affecting your uh, probability of living long. The obvious one is don't pick anything statistically risky, like, like a mercenary for the Wagner group. Don't do that. Uh, two more points. Make sure you're really passionate about what you're doing, right? 
in most countries of the world, and more and more every day in most of the developed world, the money is really not a factor of longevity. All of us make enough money to make the kind of choices we need to to get, live as long as possible. So I wouldn't worry about income too much, as most jobs, if you do them well, are good enough income. Pick a job you really love because people who have passion actually literally statistically outlive everybody else. And the other one is make sure that the work is challenging enough to make you feel like you're doing something, but not overwhelmingly stressful at all times. So you may like have a choice to be a mathematician at a university and you love teaching, you love interacting with students, it's challenging and fun, but not too much, uh, not too stressful. That could let you live longer than if you went and go traded stocks on Wall Street stonks or whatever they're called now. And uh, you know, like you make make a lot more money trading stocks, but the fucking crazy psychotic pressure of buy, buy, sell, sell. That's the only thing I know about stocks, to be honest. Um, that might just fucking drive you into the ground and you'd be fucking dead. So though that would be my advice. All right. James K. Nope, sorry, wrong person. Identity problem asks. Recently started testosterone replacement therapy during a cut. Having strength gains, but feel like I can't get the most out of it because eating in a deficiency tips, thoughts, PPL routine. No worries at all. Easy answer, super short, actually. You're not getting the most out of it. First of all, because it's replacement and not going to be a lot to get. But if you were actually medically low testosterone, you will get a lot out of it. So, but here's the thing. If you're cutting now, you won't get out of a lot out of it now. No big deal though, because you'll lose a shitload of fat and you'll probably gain just a little bit of muscle during that time. As soon as that's over and you transition back to a bulk, holy fuck, you're gonna blow up like crazy and a huge fraction more than usual is gonna be muscle and less is gonna be fat. So don't worry about the short term, get that body fat off. It's just setting you up to get those big gains later. So you're totally in the clear. All right, Sean Patton says, my super chat was skipped. Mr. Sean Patton, please let us know what your question is and at Renaissance Periodization, and we will get right the fuck back to you. Uh, if you can repeat that, because it's skipped, we don't actually see it, but let us know what it is and we'll get right to you. Scott, the video guy, you want to make sure we uh, catch him? Yeah, I'm going the best I can. All right, well, it would Very quirky. do better, okay? <laughs> That's like one of my favorite memes where it's like the, I forgot what's like Wall Street movie. And he's like, can this work? And the guy's like, no, why not? It's, they're just disappearing for no reason, guys. So we're trying to get them Thanks, YouTube. I mean, seriously, thank you. Your fucking platform is unbelievable. Could you do a little bit better? Mm, I feel so entitled saying that I'm going to shut up. All right. Next up, next up, next up is, and these are going fast. Where the, okay, 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 here we go. Boy Loik says, how much difference does optimal training volume have over just doing 10 sets per week in one session? It depends. If your 10 sets per week, at least in the workout or on the week, falls between your minimum effective volume and maximum recoverable and right in the middle, it's gonna make a small difference, maybe 15% over the course of a long term. If 10 sets are over your MRV or under your MEV, it's gonna be a night and day difference. You could gain almost nothing with 10 sets and gain everything you ever wanted with uh, something that is different. So I would say it's probably a good idea to at least try your little bit of your best to get that optimal volume going uh, versus just doing uh, some standard thing. Now I will say if your gains are going great, don't change anything, you don't have to. But if your gains are like meh or not at all, I would look into the volume thing. All right. Amni says, Mike, I've been training for a year and transform my physique thanks to you. Amazing. People ask how I do it, expecting some cheat code. I point them to you. Thank you. Well, Amni, thank you so much. Um, gee, you know, I wish I, uh, I wish I could take more credit for that, but I think you did all the hard work, so thank you so much. All right. Tim Addy says, hey, Dr. Mike, I'm looking for a new gym near the Royal Oak, near the Royal Oak, and I'm considering Powerhouse Madison Heights and Black Mamba Barbell. Any other gyms I should check out? So I think... Um, if I may say this, Scott the Video Guy. Mm -hmm. Scott the Video Guy himself trains at Black Mamba, so you can punch him in the face when you get there and tell him his videos are shit. And uh, Powerhouse Madison Heights, I've only ever heard good things about. Um, Black Mamba's great. Yeah. I think that the, I don't know any other gyms in that area good enough to recommend them, but I think between those two, you're fucking golden. Yeah. All right. D Mike. D Mick. M I C. D Mike. All right, 
Here's the question. I am trying to become stronger without putting on size. I am looking to continuously increase my base strength long term versus achieving realized strength peaking. How? How to do this without putting on size? I would say I would alternate training mostly for sets of three to six with sets of five to eight as accessories for three months or so and take one or two months to peak sets of one to three mostly with accessories at some combination of sets of three to six and five to eight. Peak, get your new lifts, one RM'd, everything great, did well. One or two weeks of deload slash active rest and then restart that process again. Mike Hamrick says, I'm 36 with an, a lot of on and off experience, but I'm looking to get into a natural competition by 40 and want to find a coach to help me with my program and get serious. Lots of good coaches, but I'll tell you this. I would highly implore you to get serious on your own. Multiple months and multiple years of fucking awesome training, putting on size, getting leaner, putting on size, getting leaner. A competition is a serious fucking thing, and it's so fucking hard. It's going to push you the furthest you've ever been pushed. So there's lots of great coaches, and Renaissance Periodization, look up our coaches, you can find one of them, and they're going to help you. They can provide you with tons of guidance and support and even motivation and inspiration. But the consistency, they physically can't make you do. So start that on your own. And when you're rolling, then I think the coach is worth the money. Before then, you got to get something going yourself. All right. Cold Servo Pie asks, my question is, what about an Anavar only cycle? I don't care about maximum gains, just very risk averse. I would run this six to eight months per year with time off. So I wouldn't run an oral past a few weeks, maybe two months or something like that. Six to eight months per year on orals is questionable. Technically speaking, Anavar for that long probably won't fuck you up, but I wouldn't make bets on that. Um, I think if you want to run something for six to eight months per year, it's probably time to go with the big boys and do the injectables. But what I would also say is if you're very risk averse, I would probably not recommend anabolic steroids at all because they destroy your health. And they're destroying mine right now. It's great. It's not great. Give that some thought. Um, all right. Posterior Pounder. Oof, what a fucking great name. Been a lot of pounding in my day. No, no, wait, wait, I said that wrong. I've been pounded a lot in my day. Deficit deadlifts are attempting, oh, sorry, are a template glute exercise. Oof, I took that a little too far. How do snatch grip deadlifts compare to deficit for fatigue and development? Ooh, I have a good answer. Similar effect on the lower body because it's essentially a deficit by widening grip, but they require quite a bit more, especially upper back activation and uh, work, and thus they're a great movement to really train your upper back to be strong and erect, dare I say. Regular deficit deadlifts train more of your hamstrings and glutes, adductors, and lower back, mid-back, and glutes, and are less limited by your upper back musculature and ability to stay upright. Hey, Mike, so now people are just adding us that didn't actually super chat. Oh, <laughs> sweet. So uh, I'm going to read some you might have guessed. Did you do best plan of attack for someone that is 30% BMI? I did. Okay. To all of you lying, fuck you. Uh, Just kidding. Did you get Harrison Grant? Can we partner in selling Kirk for Lambo time? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, I think we're... All right, back to Super Chat. Ooh, okay. Let me get one real quick with Jeremy Oram. If you were running strength and conditioning for a high school football team, high school football, woo! How would you handle that during the regular season? Ah, uh, yes, I've actually done strength and conditioning for both high school and for college. During the regular season, what you probably want is probably two weight training workouts per week. You probably want them spaced as far away from games as possible. And if important games especially occur on the weekends, then you want the workouts staggered to like Monday, Wednesday. You want the volumes to be relatively low, mostly sets of three to six repetitions. Power moves, basic strength moves, very low volume. Essentially, don't want the kids to get sore, doms, at all. That's how low of a volume. You keep them roughly the same strength, and maybe some of the kids get a little stronger during the season, and you're fucking golden. Uh, Off-season, which is fucking nine months of the year, is when they make the fucking big games. 
It's a huge, huge, super fucking big problem fallacy in high school football in the United States where people think in-season training is when you get jacked and that's fucking bullshit. It's off-season that does the work in-season. You're just trying to keep them explosive, fast, powerful, and just enough volume to keep their muscle and strength kind of where it was before they started the season. All right. Next up is Planetary Godzilla. God damn, what a sweet name. My name sucks. 33 years old, six foot, 155 pounds at 12% body fat. Goal is 200 pounds at 10% body fat. Is this possible at this age? If not, what is a realistic goal? Uh, can train six days a week, have prior experience, on or off for three years. So um, I would say it is a pretty outlandish goal that may be possible, but I'll give you better advice than that. We can't tell you if it's possible yet because you don't have enough on experience. So consistently show up to the gym, eat the food, do all the stuff, get as good of gains as you can, and after a year, see where you're at. And then after a year, see where you're at. After a year, see where you're at. If you're consistently climbing like this and like here's where you were and here's 200 at whatever percent body fat, if you're doing one of these, hey, maybe you'll get there. If you're doing one of these, probably not. If you're doing one of these, oh shit, like you'll get there soon and then have different goals. I'm not a huge fan of ultra long-term goals because essentially from like um, just a, like a, a logic space problem, there are too many unknowns. Uh, so you, you, you can't, it's, it's, it, I would say the analogy is like, um, a shitty analogy, but it's like plotting a course towards the other side of the Milky Way and say, so we're going to go this way and this way and that way and that way, except we haven't actually mapped out the Milky Way or where the fucking black holes are, or where the alien refueling stations are. So like, we're just doing make-believe. Um, it's too far in advance. The best we could do maybe as a society that's, you know, spacefaring is to go to the next inhabit habitable world, set up a colony, everything goes well, a couple millennia later, do the same thing, et cetera. And then you sort of piecemeal it as you go. I would say that's the better approach to take. Short-term goals. I'm going to gain 10 pounds in the next three months. And I'm going to lose five pounds of fat two months after that. I'm gonna, I'm, then I'm going to repeat. And then that is going to set you on a trajectory. The slope of that trajectory will allow you to predict a little bit better. Although remember, everything is asymptotic in lifting, so it's going to curve like that. So if your goal is here, but your trajectory is this, probably not going to be so likely to hit it at that time frame. Do your best, and you'll find out. That's my, my best best advice. Mike, did you get baller? How much water? Wait, can you just say from 40 plus? No. I assume baller actually paid. Yes. How much water weight can you retain from cortisol? At least five to 10 pounds. If you are taking prescription hydrocortisone or any of those other oral steroids, it can be 15 to 20 pounds, insane amounts of weight. Cortisol in the natural environment, if you're just experiencing some fatigue towards the end of a mesocycle, towards the end of the diet, easy five to 10 pounds body water. It can be less, it can be a little more, but that is kind of the expected range. Great question. All right. All right, next up, let's see who we got. I think we gotta scroll a lot for this here. Okay. Did we get all the backlog people? We're working on it. All right. <laughs> Machiavelli the Don says, how do you progress your RIR week to week when using myo reps and myo rep match? So you do the IRR, RIR the same way but you just apply it to whatever set you're doing. So for example, the first set of my rep match is a straight set. Let's say it's a two RIR week, two RIR, put the barbell down. Next, you start the mile rep set. You get to whatever reps is two RIR. Let's say it's eight, put the shit down. Let's say you got 15, now you got eight. Rest three to five seconds, pick it up again, do another, whatever two RIR is. Let's say that's five, now you're up to 13. Rest for a little bit, hit two, well, your set is done and put it away. That's how you match. So every single individual Maya rep is done with the RIR progression that you want. And then when it's RIR one, every single Maya rep shit, it goes to RIR one. That's it. Pretty straightforward. All right. Nick Aki says, Hey, Dr. Mike, when I train hard, I clench slash grind my teeth. I started wearing a mouth guard to keep them safe. Is this okay? Could it cause jaw problems? No. Mouth guards are actually recommended, I think, by uh, dental professionals when teeth grinding is a thing. They always tell me to do it. I never really do it because I'm bad at the teeth thing. 
They also say I have ugly teeth. It's not really a mean thing for them to say. Keep wearing your mouth guard. You're totally good. No, no jaw problems anticipated. Um, Scott, is the super chat back on or is it still off? Uh, I, I turned it off, so we just got the people taken care of. Okay. All right. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Ooh. Viper one one six one five seven nine asks. Um, I know a seventeen year old who is impatient and wants to ask around at his gym for steroids. What advice to keep him natty? I mean, like you can bring me over, I'll real talk the living fuck out of him. But uh, I think the best advice to folks like that is to tell them about the beneficial effects and side effects of steroids at the same time. The problem with telling people only the side effects that are bad is that they it's this 1980s anti-drug commercial bullshit and it never fucking works because they know you're keeping something from them. People do drugs like, so for example, the, if they told you, look, heroin will feel unbelievably good. Like, oh, hell yeah. It'll ruin your fucking life also. When someone tells you that, like, yeah, I, mean, I feel like if they were a really anti-drug psycho that didn't know anything about how drugs really work, they wouldn't tell me that first part. You get a little bit of sort of like a seriousness with them and a, a bit of believability. So what I would say is, look, man, at 17 years old, if you start steroids, they're going to get you jacked. Like you're going to be so much more muscular, so much leaner. Check this out. Your nuts will likely shrink down. And then when girls see your nuts when you're trying to get a beach at the party, they're going to laugh at you and probably tell everybody you know. There's a good chance there's like a 50-50 that your dick won't work. You'll get horny, super horny because you're on steroids. Your dick won't work because the hormone dynamics are all off. You got pimples like the size of part of your thumb right here. Uh, probably start going bald earlier, like in college. All kinds of really nasty shit, but you'll be jacked, baby. And they're like, holy fuck, that sucks. Like, yeah, check it out. Also, your brain is maturing and developing and your actual intelligence is still coming up. And steroids have a decently well-documented ability to impinge on that process. So you may never become as smart as you could have been unless you wait till you're like in your late 20s to consider steroids. If you throw that bullshit at them at the same time, acknowledging the good stuff, but also saying, look, there's lots of bad shit here, you give them a realistic take. And, uh, you know, that's probably the best you can do. Um, I, you could also attend to the impatience and say, like, let me tell you a, a number of great champions that were impatient. Nobody. No fucking buddy has impatience problems that fucking last, so. Yeah. All right. Back to the super chats, Scott. All right. Brent Guilin. Guilin. Sorry, Brent. I suck. Could you theoretically run a hypertrophy block for legs congruently with a strength block for bench optimally compared to dedicated blocks? Yes. If the muscle groups are completely different, it is possible. Legs, you can tra train for hypertrophy, upper body for strength, and that totally works really, really well. Close to optimum. What you don't want to do is like triceps do hypertrophy, chest do strength, because then one interferes with the other. So give that some thought. Great question. All right. Daniel Anderson. Oh, yeah. Is it going to stay out? Thanks. How do I look? Oh, I see. But how do I look? Look, do I look good? I mean, sexy. Oh, yeah, daddy. Fuck. All right. How do you pop that shirt off? Oh, I'll never pop off my Lambo shirt. You can pull my Lambo shirt off my dead body. All right. Daniel Anderson says, I got pretty bad gyno off of TRT. I had a little bit from puberty, but now it's bad. Is surgery my only option? Also, is it dangerous? Uh, I have had gynecomastia removal surgery. It is not remotely dangerous. It is one of the most well-practiced and uh, actually least invasive and most kind of open and shut procedures. It is nonetheless technically surgery, so it's serious. But I would consult with the doctor. What I would do is um, give some readings online to options about gynecomastia treatment and uh, before you get to surgery, see if any of the other work, ones work. Sometimes a course of anti-estrogens can, can really suck that down to where it just basically looks like nothing and it is good forever. People have reported that. But sometimes if you have the serious, like the hard mass, surgery is probably the only option at that point. Um, nothing I say here is medical advice. And uh, talk, to, talk to your physician or get a few other expert opinions and, and go from there. But uh, yeah, gynecomastia removal surgeries is not typically a super big deal. All right. Cameron Koppel, 
says, hi, Dr. Mike, I have to train at 6 a.m. Workouts after eating feel awful. They do. Is faster training an option to wake up at five? Lots of conflicting info online. Fucking internet, right? All this great info, but a bunch of it's fucking wrong. There's absolutely nothing wrong with faster workouts. Faster workouts are totally great. Wake up, have like half a thing of Gatorade, half a thing away if you don't want totally fasted and you're good to go. Or wake up, have some fluids, go to the gym, you'll be golden, eat your post-workout meal. I train fasted basically every day. I don't talk about it a lot because I don't want to offend anyone, but there's a small, most people who are into fasting or whatever are awesome. There's a small fraction of fasting people that are fucking psychotic and I don't want to be mistaken for them. So like I wake up generally like around 9 a.m., 8.30 to 9, and I start training around like 9.30 or 10, and I don't eat anything before, and everything goes great because all the glycogen is loaded and everything's good. And then right after I have my post-workout cereal, which I'm sure you guys have seen on my Instagram. Who what? Alex or the book Tammy. Man, this is awful. Wow. Okay, I got it. I got it. It disappeared from the chat. I found it. I'm just not gonna look at the 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 top bullshit. I'm not gonna look at it. I'll just scroll. Yeah. Alex asks, does it matter how you weigh rice, dry or cooked? And do you weigh uh, meat slash chicken raw or cooked? It does matter, it does matter. So it matters what the recipe is and it matters how you're reading the uh, instructions. So if it's like cups of rice, almost always it should specify raw or cooked. If it doesn't, whoever your coach is, ask them to specify or whatever the recipe is, look up and see if it's specified. If it's grams of weight, it's almost always dry and you can just assume that. And then after you cook it, it doesn't fucking matter because you know how much total rice you made and you portion it evenly and you're good to go. The problem with rice is based on how you cook it, it weighs more or less, but on average, I think it's multiplied by about three or four. So like if it's 40 grams uh, dry, it ends up being like 160 grams uh, cooked or something like that. Meat, oh, I would almost always weigh out raw because the cooked meat is based on how much you cook it. It's actually gonna shrink in size and weight, but the protein content stays the same. So there you go. All right, Ahan Shankwakar. I know you, fam. I know you from like eight other forums. This is awesome. Thank you for your question. Meta wrote an article about CNS fatigue not being a very, a big result of heavy lifting. Why do low rep deadlifts make my whole body tired and lower my focus slash drive? I think it's because um, CNS fatigue or it's just generally called fatigue in sports science, cumulative fatigue or otherwise known as systemic fatigue, I think is real. I I, I love Meno. Meno's actually a great personal friend of mine. Um, I just disagree with him about this cordially. I think it's real fatigue, systemic fatigue is real, to your point. Like, I'm sure I'm wrong on a bunch of stuff. I'm sure Derek Moore played some more dates is flaying me right now. Hey, hey Scott, can you can you look it up and see if he's talking shit about us? Sure. Motherfucker. Take a shot at this title. All right. Kevin Smith asks, do you drink diet soda year round? Does it have any effect on micro gut biome, Coke Zero Rocks? So, so far we don't know a whole lot about the microbiome. We do know that it's very adaptable. Like bacteria are very fucking resilient. Sort of, short of nuking them with all the antibiotics in the world, it's really not a big deal. Here's the thing. I do drink Coke year round. I have no GI issues whatsoever, so I'm not terribly worried about it. Interestingly enough, of all of the artificial sweeteners they've tested so far, Stevia or Stevia, depending on how you pronounce it, has the most prominent deleterious, not deleterious, it's a, it's a terrible word to use here, marginally slightly negative effect on your gut microbiome. And it's the natural one. Aspartame seems to ups and downs, doesn't really do much on the net balance. And I think Coke Zero is mostly sucralose. And I don't think that affects the gut microbiome to a large extent, as of the studies that I've seen so far. Uh, there could be more studies that point one direction or another. I will say that it's probably not a big deal. And the long-term literature on the consumption of diet soda or other artificial sweeteners when properly cofactored for everything, seems like nothing bad is happening. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. And at some point, like, uh, how fucking important is the gut microbiome if it's gonna keep me away from drinking fucking diet soda, God damn it, it better be super fucking important. And it's not. He did a 40 minute critique of your Star Trek Oral Journey video. Of my 15 minute video. And I don't I love know it. if it's positive, negative, or otherwise. I'm sure it's, yeah. It's but weird. the title is dot, 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 pardon, question mark. Oh shit. Yeah. Controversy. Yeah. <laughs> Lamborghini fund. <laughs> All right. Okay. 
Ooh, of course it skipped a bunch. Holy shit, it skipped a ton. All right. What the fuck? Oh. Hold up, folks. I got to get to scrolling properly. Okay. Jacob Mackey asks, hey, Dr. Mike, does semaglutide allow progress, hypertrophy, in parentheses, to be achieved at a lower body fat than without? And will you use it for your next show? I don't think it has an effect on uh, the body fat situation much, probably a small marginal effect. I would think it's the hypertrophy occurs at the same body weights either way. It does squash the living fuck out of your hunger, and I will almost certainly be using it for my next show. Yeah, good question. Ahan Shan Shankwakar is back. If NSAIDs plus cryo, he asks, clear away inflammatory cells needed for healing slash adaptation, wouldn't they also prevent proper healing post-injury? Yes, they actually would. And there are at least a few research papers showing that healing time and healing completeness from people that took a lot of very powerful anti-inflammatories is lessened than people who didn't. So I see your body's actually very good at healing properly with NSAIDs and cryo, et cetera. It just takes longer to heal. So I wouldn't worry about completeness of healing as much as the duration. So what I would say is use NSAIDs and cryo only to the extent that you're interested in controlling extra way getting in the way of your daily life and pain tolerance, inflammation, and potentially using them in the tail three or four days before a really important competition if you happen to still be sore and tight so that you can get clear of all that to compete. Outside of that, I really just wouldn't use them unless it's to, again, like you're really hurting and you need some fucking shit to take the edge off. Yeah. Um, the whole thing with like people regularly getting cryo as a part of the normal training, even though they're concerned with adaptation, uh, bad idea, really fucking not ideal. Not a huge problem, but like a needless chink in the armor where you don't fucking need one. All right. Will McSwain says, thank you, Dr. Mike, for all the knowledge. I just started BJJ. Any advice for a new white belt? Follow Sloth Report on Instagram immediately. That's my coach, Josh Vogel. He's great. He knows things. And advice for new white belt is just have fun, do your best, and just try to learn the techniques. And don't do this a lot and do, oh, where am I supposed to be putting my hands? Oh, it's here and things are working. Or they're not. But in any situation, ask yourself, what could I be doing here that can improve my position? Just a little bit. So if someone's trying to choke you, just put your hand here and try to push it away. And if someone's on top of you and you, oh, I know how to get out of a shrimp. Just at every moment, try to be rational, logical, calm, collected, and just try to do your best. And you're going to notice that you're really fucking slow and terrible and you get beat a lot. No big deal. Your brain is a neural network, uh, not AI, but uh, NI, natural intelligence, and it learns automatically. So you just expose it to multiple trials and you have no idea how it's learning. It learns anyway. So even if you're thinking, oh my God, it's so overwhelming. I can't remember all this bullshit. Just try to do your best at every intersection. And at first you're going to be slow and shitty and awful. And then eventually you're going to get better and better and better. And you're going to be like, oh my God, I know things. And then here's where it's really going to hit you. After about six months to a year, a new white belt will come to the gym and they'll, you'll go with them and you'll just beat the living fuck out of them. And you're like, oh my God, they don't know anything. And that's when you first realize you know stuff. Best of luck, man. I wish you the best. James Caldwell says, had horrible tennis and or golfer's elbow in both, waited seven months, able to get back in after physical therapy, still too much doms in forums after workouts. Whoa, trippy. Damn. Okay. If your forearms are getting super domsy, Try not squeezing the bar as much. Another thing is, if you have DOMS in the forearms, don't train them until they heal, but then train them when they heal and eventually the DOMS will subside and get less frequent. And during that time, you'll probably hypertrophy the fuck out of your forearms. So you just kind of slowly ease into it. And if you are in a situation where your forearms only get crazy DOMS on one day a week, but then you wait a whole week and then that, on the, that same one day that workout causes crazy DOMS, what I would do is invest in some like grippers or something and like two other days of the week, evenly interspaced, do a couple of sets of gripper work, like Iron Mind has great grippers, and then it's going to build up your forearm strength so that you probably don't experience DOMS anymore, or much less, and then you'll probably be better off. And then we'll shut it down. Yep. All right. The Super Chat shit got crazy, yo. Yeah. And James Martin just joined. All right, James Martin. Folks, if you join our little cult, 
cult. We're going to have animal sacrifices, crazy shit, teens. Are we allowed to say that? No, nah, we're not. JK, we'll have cool cult shit. All right. Michael Bolin, not to be confused with Michael Bolton, of course, asks, any upcoming audiobooks you can disclose, and will these streams be more regular slash frequent? I think Scott, the video guy, and I are going to be trying to do this once. Uh, and Jared Feather's going to probably join, maybe even this coming week. Maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks or something, we'll be getting in the live and embarrassing ourselves. And by ourselves, I mean me. Scott's behind the camera. He has nothing to worry about. I how it works better, too. <laughs> um, we'll get better at this. So, yes, we will be doing this more. Any upcoming audiobooks? Ooh, I think Dr. James Hoffman is secretly writing a general sport training book that is almost certainly going to get an audiobook, and I would really look into that. I've got other stuff in the works that I definitely can't talk about, but it's cool. It's like um, the Death Star, but bigger. Thank you for your question, Michael. Charles Rosebushes. If that's your real name, I swear to God, that's the greatest name ever. Says, more leg annihilation, specifically squats, are poor athletes. When is that one video with the pro hockey player guy? Soon, a couple weeks. We've already filmed, like, I don't know, four months of training uh, that's going to be released. And more than a few of those videos are, like, videos you might, like, not want to watch around your kids because they're just going to start crying. Because why is that bald man hurting that nice young man in his legs or that nice young girl in her legs. And that's, uh, it's tough, tough times. August 22nd, so next Monday, a hockey player died. Next Monday, not this coming, the Monday after, yeah. there will be a dead hockey player. Well, so, okay, this shit just skipped to like a bunch. Uh, okay, here we go. All right, last couple of questions here, folks. Baller asks, what is the best way to bring cortisol levels down Diet break and cardio break, cardio reduction to maybe half of what you're doing, diet back to maintenance, multiple nights of good sleep, multiple days of maintenance eating, and those multiple days should also be relatively low stress. The stress thing is fucking huge. It's critical. And if you are not below 10% body fat, your cortisol will come down substantially. If you're below 10% body fat, just kind of grind away and finish and then get the bug out. Best of luck, man. The sleep and the low stress is really, really big. Did you want to say something, Scott, the video guy? Uh, apparently, the more plates, more nights meal was cool. Allegedly. That's what people are saying. Cool isn't like he had a good time ragging on my dumb ass, or no, cool isn't like. Huh. Allegedly. Well, thanks, Derek. <laughs> I, I always I think of him going to the bank and, and uh, he like he gives them the ID and they cash a check and they're like, oh, Mr. More Plates, More Dates. Like, that's his last name. Does he have a last name that we know about? Wouldn't it be sweet if it just nobody actually knew who he was? He's on Joe Rogan, and Joe's like, so what's your name? He's like, Derek. He's like, it's more plates, more dates. Like Sting or Madonna. Sting or Madonna, man. Do I need a nickname? Is Dr. Mike my nickname? That sucks. Jizz guy. That's a sweet name. <laughs> I'm like in a super outfit. Like, jizz guy, do your thing. I'm like, I can't. I'm afraid of crowds, and I have small penis. <sighs> Back to the super chat. All right. Leland Massaro. Damn, Leland, I see your profile pic flexing on us. Damn. 35K daily steps. Holy fuck. High intensity hypertrophy training for 75 minutes daily. One to 1.5 hours of cardio at just below tempo pace running 155 HT. <sighs> 155 heart rate, 225 pounds at 8.5% body fat, 125 grams of carbs from veggies, uh, EST estimated on complete carb, estimates on complete carb deplete, fuck, <laughs> three days of only veggies and proteins and fats and you've got no fucking carbs in you at all, maybe one day, this is insane dude, yeah. And then here's the thing, if you keep this remotely, this output up, the carb load to fully glycogen restore you might have to be like five days of 1,500 grams of carbs each time. I've never seen someone this active, Leland. Holy fuck. 
you're like a fucking superhero. Like, what was it, Jizz Guy or Jizz Man? Jizz Guy. Watch him fail to jizz. Does YouTube cancel us for jokes like that? Jizz is okay. All right, it's 2022. Jizz is fine. Pablo Z asks, how true is it that closed-toed shoes affect sport performance? Do I need to worry about wearing certain types of shoes to prevent imbalances? The imbalances thing is almost certainly bullshit. Shoes do affect your performance, but I think it has less to do with closed-toed and more like what kind of shoe you're wearing. There's um, kind of like a, a barefoot community, barefoot training advocates. It's my estimate is that 20% of them are very rational people giving you really awesome real-world advice that really helps, especially if you have foot problems. And then maybe 80% of them, and maybe I'm just being a dick and not charitable, which is totally possible, or like insane people. Um, I think that's every community, bodybuilding community, Dr. Mike himself, 80% crazy, talking about himself in the third person. Fuck did I just do that for him? Anyway, yeah, I wouldn't worry about it too much, Pablo, but if you're having foot problems, I think the barefoot community can have some really great solutions for you. Just below that. Matt C says, Dr. Mike, do you remember me? Question mark, question Matt mark. C, pause. <laughs> pause the live stream. Just kidding. Matt C, not only do we remember you, you have never been forgotten and never will be. We literally, you know what, man? Matt C, TBH, we have an Arsenal Smith machine that like doesn't work well, so we're getting rid of it. Do you want it? I will legit pay shipping for you if you take ownership of the machine and just get a picture of you with them using the machine and a free Smith machine. And I know you're gonna say no because you hate it. To let the rest of you in on the joke, Matt C was one of our earliest YouTube commentators and he just went for that every time we used a Smith machine. You guys are fucking idiots and dumb and assholes. And then every now and again, he said some nice shit and which would made it, would made it nice. We love you, Matt C. You are a fucking hero to us. Of course we remember you, we'll never forget. And I assume you actually look like Shaggy from, uh, was that's your avatar? All right. All right, next up is Sharky. Sharky asks, what do we have to do to get on one of your brutal training sessions that get posted to YouTube? Well, you know, I'm not allergic to blowjobs, Sharky. Or am I? Um, it depends on where you live. If you live very far away from the United States, it's difficult. It depends on who you are in real life. If you're like a psycho that's gonna kill us all, no. If you're jacked or lean, that helps. If you're famous, that also helps. If we know you in real life, that helps. If you're on Instagram, you know, comment on one of my posts and be like, hey, I was that asshole that wanted to train on YouTube. And, um, you know, if, if it's in the wherewithal and if you live close enough or some shit like that, maybe we'll consider it. But TBH Sharky, we are stacked full for the foreseeable future other assholes that are gonna to need to suffer. Maybe there's a chance in the future. Thank you for asking. Jared Feather just basically brings us pros that I think he hates, and then we hurt them on camera. All right, John Handy says, hey, Dr. Mike, third try. Fuck, man. All right. How would you best slash worst time fat loss maintenance mass phase with the MPT male physique template training blocks. How would you best? Okay. So basically I got stuff to, okay. So for the part of it, that's like the maintenance part, always maintenance. For mesos one, two, and three, you can do fat loss, no problem. You can do muscle gain, no problem. And you can also do maintenance on meso one but I wouldn't do maintenance on meso two or on the metabolite meso. And I wouldn't do anything but maintenance on the, uh, the recovery meso at the end. This will be posted to YouTube, it will be saved. So if you need to come back, John, and re-listen to that, I promise you I said all the true things. And if you re-listen to that, it'll be, you can write it down and it'll be, it'll be true shit. Um, in addition to that, we have a few videos on the RP YouTube of timing your nutrition to training and the general principles from there you can apply to the MPT. Just consider that mesos one, two, and three are what we call hard training, hypertrophy training. The fourth meso of the, the easy stuff is not hypertrophy training, it's maintenance only. And then meso one 
can be a maintenance meso because it's not super high volume, but mesos two and three are really saved only for fat loss or muscle gain. So great question. Very, very good question. All right, next up is Phil Carta. What a great name. Doctor, since my contest prep finished two months ago, off-plan meals are bringing me up to five pounds plus, and it doesn't go away like it used to. Any tips to get the one meal weight increases back off 10 pounds up from stage? So first of all, if you finished prep two months ago, 10 pounds up from stage is not a big deal. Second thing, after shows, especially after the first couple of shows you do, this gets better over time. Super mysterious mechanism. I have no fuck clue how it works. I'm sure somebody does or will soon. Your body gets really crazy sensitive to food and to fucking getting, um, holding body weight from that, holding body water rather. And the first time you start eating remotely normally or off plan, you just gain a fuckload of weight. Because first of all, you're eating a lot. And second of all, it's got salt and tons of carbs and it's just the thing. And I noticed like I, even for the first several months after my first prep, I, 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 so here's what happened to me. I did my first prep, got abs. Two days after the prep ended, I didn't have abs and I didn't see them again until my next diet. <laughs> the body water slowly leached off while the fat slowly put on at the same rate. Literally months of body water re reducing really slowly. So it seemed like it doesn't, wasn't doing anything. And then it just replaced and then I ended up just like not having abs. So it's a thing. It's just going to take time. And I will say it gets better every time you prep and you can actually probably fix it once you mass enough to where it's hard to eat food and you're like, oh, I hate eating. Take an active rest or maintenance phase, go into a mini cut and the mini cut will clean your ass up. Your body water handling will get better. And then you start slow, healthy food, mostly massing up again. It should be much, much less of a problem if it's a problem even at all. All right. How? I'm just fucking scrolling down. What the fuck? So Framed asked a question and they paid for that. Mike, 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 comma. What day is it? Question mark. Wednesday. I kind of wouldn't have known otherwise. Uh, another good question is like, what year is it? This is not my joke, some other comedian, but like, try just wearing your underwear, frazzle your hair up like crazy and just a trench coat, you could get arrested or shot for this. Run into like a, a gas station that is like in the middle of the night, not a lot of people go to and just run in and go, what year is it? Cause they'll think you're coming out of a time machine or you'll get shotgunned to death. Don't actually try this at home. Brian Livingston. Hey, yo dog. No problem family. Thoughts on doing a video series about the molecular processes of training, sliding filament theory, how creatine turns into ATP, etc. Okay. So that's all really good stuff. You know, I wonder, I think I have some of that in, in videos I used to make for class when I was a professor at that general level. I wonder if I still have those videos. They're awful. I used to be a shitty public speaker. It's probably not something I'm going to do anytime soon. And I'll tell you why. These are great, great, great topics. The thing is, it seems that there's lots of good places online to get that kind of education already. And they have really cool infographics and really cool, like actual graphics. And Scott, the video guy, is a sex addict. He doesn't make graphics. And um, I think other people can do that better. What I think I can do pretty well, the best I can do at anything, and certainly not the best in the world, is teach the combination of science and practice and a little bit more towards the practical end of getting you guys leaner and more jacked and maybe even some psychology thrown in there occasionally. And that's probably what we're going to stick to only because of the opportunity cost of not doing that. I'll put it another way. We have, uh, I have a list of um, videos that we have to record. And then I have another list of PowerPoints I already made for those videos. And then we have a list of videos we've already recorded. Right now, the list of videos we've already recorded lasts how long, Scott? What, six months? Yeah. Six months out on already recorded videos. Those are done. Those are just sitting in a Dropbox and Scott posts them to YouTube every now and again. And you can only post like 20 or 30 YouTube videos at a time. So we do that. The PowerPoints that I've made last another six months on top of that. 
the list of videos topics and with many outlines that I've made is at our normal release rate of four videos a week is doped out to like six years from now. So yeah, we add other videos all the time and sometimes new video topics slide in. We have so much fucking sports science to teach you guys um, that I don't know if it's in our wherewithal to get into the basics um, because I think other people comparatively, um, actually economics term called comparative advantage, I think they have a better comparative advantage than we do. And our comparative advantage is making this kind of bullshit and saying things like jizz guy a lot. Why the fuck do you guys follow me at all? Jesus, not funny. I'm balding, too much creatine. Scott the video guy sucks. Fucked up this live stream. <laughs> JK. One more question and then we're out. We have one last member question. Fuck. Is it from... Yeah, I knew you couldn't say that shit. John Payritz. John, your last name is so easy to say in my Jewish guy accent that I can't say it any other way. So Payritz it is. Aye. John asks, Dr. Mike, have you ever heard of anyone isolating a muscle so much that the supporting muscles are taken out, causing pain slash snapping, elbows, hips, etc.? Hmm. That would be fucking impressive. I think that's what happens if you get struck by lightning. Like you can pull your bone off with your bicep. Electrocution, also electricity. Um, in real life, you know, technically speaking, you can contract your quad so hard under a max squat, you can pull your quad off the bone. Um, generally speaking, um, I don't know if it's a matter of isolating the muscle, but it's imposing tension on that system and something breaks. I did see a really nasty injury once. I'm going to say this. If you're not good with injury, even descriptions, just like, mute the shit. But I saw a video of a girl tear her adductor in the middle of a squat and her knee just collapses in. It's super, super disturbing. Um, so shit like that definitely happens. Although I think the most insane injury was when uh, Jeff Goldblum in The Fly, Scott, you remember that shit? Oh, yeah. Was doing arm wrestling and he um, broke a guy's fucking bone uh in his wrist arm wrestling him because he had his new fly powers after the genetic discombobulation i will say though it's some credit to jeff goldblum because the fly powers clearly but really that guy broke his own arm because short of breaking your own arm you could just do this and if you're strong enough to snap your own wrist that guy is a goddamn world champion at a regular bar and whatever fucking fly city jeff goldblum is in Sorry, Mike, just one more and then we're definitely done. Yeah. Ahan said we missed his. So if you could get that, that's it. <laughs> Boom. All right. Ahan Shankwakar. I'm sorry if I'm fucking up your name. Your name's baller as fuck. Also, your quads look big as shit. And your delts. Goddamn, that better be you in that fucking profile picture or else I'm complimenting some porn star or something. Do Maya reps have a benefit beyond saving time? Because aren't reps beyond four RIR still somewhat stimulative? And don't straight sets allow you to do more work? So, Han, I, I saw that exact question of yours in the Jared and Mike YouTube for members, and we answered it. And that'll be coming out in uh, probably about a week and a half. But I'll hit you up again here. Um, sometimes my reps have a better stimulus to fatigue. And one of the things they do is for sure save time. But another thing they do is allow you to have multiple approaches to failure and to sequester a shitload of metabolites. And because straight sets have so many lead-in reps before the hard reps start, for many muscles, that's very effective. But for muscles that require a shitload of volume or muscles that clear metabolites really fast, muscles that are difficult to fatigue, a lot of times my reps have that exact specific ability to hit so many approaches to failure that it ends up being just better than doing straight sets, even if we equate the volume of work. Marginally better, but I think better nonetheless. So that's my best um, best impersonation of someone that gives good answers. I'm scrolling. Scrolls off. We're done. Should I say goodbye to everybody? Folks. <laughs> I just saw one question out of the corner of my eye. D Waits 10 asks, what's your opinion on more plates, more dates? Um... I haven't seen a ton of his videos. I think I've seen like two and uh, they seem pretty cool. He's uh, super funny. 
Um, and he's just so goddamn good looking. Uh, really, I just put him on mute and just stare. But uh, yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. You know, like, yeah, I have no strong opinion whatsoever. Folks, go watch more More Plates, More Dates. Try to watch some of our stuff. Buy things. The Lambos aren't free. If you want the shirt, by the way, let us know. And uh, Team Full Rom will probably be selling it. Thank you so much for doing this live with us. Thank you so much for all our Super Chat folks for giving us the pathetic money that we need to keep our Lambo fund going. And we will see you next time. We will post as usual in the YouTubes to give you a flash warning of when the live is coming. We're going to do the live again. Next time, if you can talk him into it, Miss, Mr. Jared Feather's coming for a visit to old Michigan. Maybe we'll get him on a live. So get in for that. And uh, we will do this again next time. Thank you so much. And this will be posted. Yes, got the video guy? This will be posted. So if I say anything stupid, play it on Rewind. If I say anything smart, rewatch that. Send it to your friends. And most importantly, go visit your grandma. Bring your tablet. Show her some Dr. Mike videos. Watch her finally realize there's nothing left to live for in this world. This is a state of the art. She's going to be out. And you can finally put her to peace. I'll see you guys next time.